This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later in the video. Today I'm going to show you my artisan sourdough bread recipe from start to finish. It's easier than you probably heard. Hi, I'm Sune and I'm a food geek. Some of you may ask if I didn't do this before, and yes I did. Uh, it was in my video, Sourdough Bread for Beginners, I showed you how to make artisan sourdough bread from start to finish, but in the meantime, I've done many, many valuable experiments. Those experiments have led me to this new and much simpler recipe, the Food Geek Master Recipe for Artisan Sourdough Bread. If you want to watch the experiments, I'm linking a playlist for all the videos in the card above. Also, to bake this bread, you will need a sourdough starter. You cannot substitute with commercial yeast. If you don't have one, you can go watch my video on the subject. It's not hard at all. Just follow the link in the card above. Okay, now all that is over. Let me give you the information you need to succeed with this. So let's start out with the equipment. One, a bowl and something to cover it with. I have one of these nifty clip-on lids that I use, but you can just cover it with a dish towel. Two, a scale. Yes, I know some of you guys watching are probably used to using measuring spoons, but you will get more consistent results uh, you, when you use a scale. That's also why all the measurements are in grams. You'd simply need too many decimal points if you used ounces. Three, a bench scraper. You can do without it, but it's so much easier uh, when you have one. Four, banetons or proofing baskets. If you don't have them, you can use a bowl lined with a dish towel. It works just as well. Five, then you'll need a lam, which is basically a contraption that helps you hold a razor blade, which you use to score the bread. You can also use a really sharp knife, but scoring is pretty hard to learn. So having a razor blade will help you do it more easily. If you want inspiration for different types of scores, I made a video with 12 different scores. Follow the card above. Six, a baking steel and a Dutch oven are great tools to have. If you don't have a baking steel, you can use an inverted cookie sheet. And to cover your dough, you can use any vessel that fits snugly over top of the bread. That can go safely into an oven. Why do we even need to cover the dough? Well, to have the bread rise, you need for the crust not to set too quickly. And what helps is steam. When we cover the dough with something, the dough warms the water in the dough and it turns into steam, which will help the bread rise because it cannot escape. I've done tests and a Pyrex bowl and an enamel roaster gives the same results as the Dutch oven. I'm sure lots of other things works just fine. Seven, you'll need some heat proof gloves. Eight, an oven. If you have a steam oven, more power to you. Use the built-in steaming when you bake. When you bake bread, it's great to have an oven that can go really warm. Nine, a wire rack to use to cool your bread. Why is this important? Well, if you leave it on the counter, the steam escaping from the bread right after it comes out will condense and possibly make the bread's bottom soggy. And we don't want no soggy bottom, right? <laughs> That's it for the equipment. I've left links uh, for some of the cheaper versions of these in the description. They may not be exactly the same as mine, but they will do the job. That way you can get started without breaking the bank. The flour that I'm using is just regular bread flour from the supermarket. You should try and get a flour that has between 12 and 13% protein. The protein in wheat flour is the kind that develops a gluten network, which we will need for the bread to stand proud and get a nice oven spring. When it comes to the water that you use, some people tell me that the water quality where they live is bad and contains additives that may kill the, the yeast. You probably know your own water supply. If it's not great, use bottled water instead. Squarespace is a platform that lets you easily build your own presence on the web. Maybe you want to build a blog for all your sourdough recipes, or maybe you're launching your own micro bakery. You get almost unlimited options in how your site should work. There's blogging features built in to share recipes, photos, and videos. You can categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. 
Squarespace has modern templates for almost any subject, and they look sleek and professional no matter what device your users use, be it on Windows, Mac, or mobile phone or tablet. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com foodgeek to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. The hydration of this bread is 70%. That means that if all the flour in the bread weighs 1,000 grams, then all of the water in the bread weighs 70% of that, which is 700 grams. It's important to note that the flour and the water in the sourdough starter counts towards the hydration. Most commonly, we use 100% hydration starter, which means half of the starter is flour and the other half is water. 70% hydration is higher than your commonly yeasted bread, but not so high that it should be difficult, even if you haven't tried it before. When it comes to your oven, it's great if it can go really hot. I usually bake at 260 degrees Celsius, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. I've also done experiments with temperature and it's possible to bake fine bread all the way down to 200 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. This won't work if you have a higher hydration bread though. If you'd like to support the channel, please buy some merch or you can use the links in the description for tools and ingredients. Or consider becoming a Patreon, which I'm linking in the card above. Thank you. Those were the words, this is the recipe. The written recipe, the ingredients and the amounts are linked in the description and the card above. First you should put all the ingredients in a bowl. 539 grams of bread flour, 148 grams of whole grain flour, I'm using dark rye, and 15 grams of salt. Then mix the ingredients with your fingers until it's completely distributed. Then add 148 grams of sourdough starter. This should be fed before using and then grown to its peak. Then add 496 grams of water. Then mix the ingredients until all the flour has been hydrated. There should be no dry bits at all. Once you've mixed the dough, cover it and let it rest for one hour. Then it's time to do the first set of stretch and folds. Stretch and folds help develop gluten in the dough by agitating it. It's just like kneading, but much more gentle. Once it's done, cover it and let it rest for 30 minutes. Then it's time for the second set of stretch and folds. Put it away for another 30 minutes. Then it's time for a third set of stretch and folds. After we're done with those, we check the gluten development by picking up a flap of the dough and stretching it as far as it'll go, so the dough gets super thin. If the dough doesn't break, it's great, and we can go on. If the dough breaks, it means the gluten hasn't been properly developed, and I will usually do another set of stretch and folds, and pause for 30 minutes, and then redo the test. Then put the dough into a bulking container. The one that I'm using is a plastic container with relatively straight sides. I aim for the dough to grow about 25%. So I will mark the top of the dough. Then I mark 100% growth and then I eyeball 25%. Then I put it in my proofer set to 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Once the dough has grown 25%, I divide it into two equally sized pieces. And then I pre-shape each piece. The dough is pulled across the table so that the dough is pulled down in the front. That way it's creating tension on the top of the dough, keeping the dough together. The reason we do a pre-shape is because we have two loaves and split the dough down the middle. If we were just making one, we could have just proceeded to the final shape of the dough because it was already the right shape. I pre-shape both into bowls, but when I final shape, I will shape one into a bowl, which is round, and one into a batard, which is cigar shaped. People often ask me what size my banatons are. I normally bake 700 gram loaves, the round banneton is 18 centimeters, 7 inches across. The oval banneton is 18 centimeters, 7 inches on the short side. And it's 25 centimeters, 10 inches on the long side. After the pre-shaped doughs have rested for 20 minutes, I final shape them. The round is final shaped the same way it was pre-shaped. After its shape, it's put into a banneton that's dusted with rice flour. The reason we use rice flour is because it's gluten-free and it won't get absorbed into the dough. That way, it's much more non-stick. The cigar-shaped one is shaped very differently, so now you can watch it carefully and see how it's done. After it's shaped, we put it into the banneton and we end with a stitch, so we'll get an even more taut surface. And then we put them both in the fridge. They stay there for at least 8 hours and up to 48 hours. Make sure your fridge is super cold, that way your bread won't over ferment. Mine is set to 2 degrees Celsius, that's about 35 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Just put it as low as you can go. Then when you decide to bake, load the oven with your baking steel and your Dutch oven. I have a combo cooker, which can go upside down. I will normally heat my oven for an hour. When you're ready to bake, grab the dough from the fridge. Dust the bottom of the loaf with rice flour and flip it onto a peel. Then dust the top with more rice flour for a cool look.
and then grab your lamb and score the dough in whatever pattern you desire. Take the top off the Dutch oven and put it somewhere safe. Then grab the peel and put the dough into the Dutch oven. Put the top of the Dutch oven back on the bottom. Close the oven and let the bread bake for 20 minutes. Then open the oven and take off the top. Ooh, nice. Close the door and turn the oven down to 230 degrees Celsius, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Let the bread bake for about 20 minutes more until it's golden brown and crispy. And then take it out of the oven and put it on a wire rack. Bake the second bread the exact same way. All that's left is let the bread cool off for a couple hours and then eat it with your favorite butter. Do you know what's smooth as butter? B-roll. Doesn't that bread just look delicious? I hope you'll try and make it because baking sourdough bread is very rewarding. Plus, it gives you an excuse to eat more butter. If you're unsure about anything, consult the recipe on my website, which is linked in the description. I hope you learned something today. See you next time.